Okay. Because it's sort of nicer when it's continuation. Yeah, the the uh, yeah. the next course is going to be a lot of fun. That's where uh, we start to learn to do a lot more advanced things. That was my favorite. How's your research going? So it's coming good, but, uh, sort of from one to another. So oh, yeah? On project, Weren't and, you doing uh, like cameras or something, infrared? Yeah, we're, we're just testing the web camera from the lighting chamber. And nice. Just oh, wow, very good. So you're finally. Uh... That's, that's, I think that's going to be a part of it. Uh, but once that project is over, I have to. We have another test set up in mind, which I'd have to do And that would be mostly my PhD. Wow, very good. I'm excited to do something. I'll tell you the test. Oh, yeah, yeah. To, to build a setup and sort of work with that and figure that out. I went to the wrong side, didn't I? You know, I love astronomy and I like, you know, contemplating all of the different kinds of magnet structures out there and how, and our place and everything. But uh, for me, when you start to look at some of the stuff, like doing research in the area, you're always taking a bunch of data from a satellite or a telescope, and you're just trying to like extract information from it. And that's where it started losing all the wonder for me. But, but uh, you're, in, you're an instrumentation design, aren't you? Yes. So I think it's a good combination of somehow I'm mad with the combination of Building a test setup, but also testing with it. So, so I think it's a good balance. Very good. Yeah, that's cool. And then, like, having to account for how to work All right, how's it going? Okay, oh my God.
my goodness. Yeah, I think if you guys come to the next course, it's going to be, that's where you really start to get a lot of analytical numerical might, you know? Be way worth it. Shell fan. How's everything going? All right, guys, it's 9.30. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, all right, so good. So we're past our midterm. We've passed uh, one lecture that we had to reschedule two different times. So we're back on regular schedule now. And uh, we're going to have, so we have 10 lectures left, right? 10 lectures left in the course. And we have about three chapters left to get through. And then this little piece of today. So we're going to kind of, Move a little faster, I suppose, but maybe not. Uh, I think, I think we'll we'll have just enough time. All right. Okay. So what we were talking about last lecture, I'm going to move back about a slide or two from what we did before, and we were talking about lossy media at normal incidence was the first thing we discussed. That was a little bit different, right? Lossy media and normal incidence. We're assuming we have an interface between two uh, infinite homogeneous half spaces but that interface exists between two half spaces that have loss. So there's epsilon mu and sigma in the medium one and epsilon mu and sigma in medium two. Now epsilon mu and sigma are different, right? In general. So what we have here is the incident field has an alpha associated with it in medium one and a beta because we have permittivity and permeability and conductivity now, right? Okay, so they're right here, alpha. Has, is a function of omega, epsilon, and sigma. And uh, beta is also a function of omega, mu, and, and sigma in general, right? Okay, so we have some attenuation because we have some loss in medium one, the incident field, the magnetic field is also incident in that medium. And technically, uh, these this wave impedance here should be complex, right? So it should be a to one C, but let's, let's write it as a to one for now. Then we can write the reflected field as gamma times the incident with its own uh, attenuation constant, alpha one, or it's the same attenuation constant, same medium, but it has alpha one. And we have the magnetic field that's reflected, gamma times E naught with a complex wave impedance as well and attenuation. So everything's the same except we add an E to the alpha, right? We add an E to the minus alpha Z, E to the alpha Z. And then the transmitter field in general has a different alpha because it's a different medium and a different wave impedance because it's in a different medium, right? and a different wave number, beta two. Everything else is the same. So once you set that up, all you have to do is uh, determine what the alphas and betas are and then the wave impedance. So here's alpha, here's beta, here's the wave impedance, a to c, complex because of sigma, right? If sigma is equal to zero, then that eta goes to the original one that we know for lossless media, square root of mu over epsilon. All right, the same formulas for normal incidence, gamma at the boundary, a to C2 minus A to C1 over A to C2 plus A to C1, and it has the same meaning, and same with the transmission coefficient. And then you can calculate the power densities. All right? So that, that case is straightforward. It's the same as lossless media at normal incidence, if we have to 
account for the losses through attenuation constants and complex wave impedances. Good. Okay. Uh, okay, hold on one second. Steven, do you hear any noise yet? Is the microphone working? You had a comment. Anyone else online, can they confirm that the audio is working? Okay, great, thank you. Great, okay. Now we get to the case that's a little bit more difficult. We're obliquely incident upon a medium that's lossless. So we have oblique incidence on a dielectric slash conductor interface. The lefty medium has epsilon one, mu one, no sigma. So the incident medium is dielectric. The transmitted medium, medium two, has epsilon two, mu two, and sigma two, all right? So in general, we write the transmitted electric field as E2, some vector, right? Some vector E2, uh, E to the minus gamma two, because the medium, the wave number, or the propagation constant in this medium has attenuation and phase delay, right? So gamma in general, and then we write this transmitted K vector as X sine theta plus Z cosine theta, right? All right, what's the problem here? The problem here is that we don't know what the transmission angle is. Normally we apply Snell's law to find that, right? Okay, but here the transmission angle is going to turn out to be complex. So that's the only difficulty here. So all we have to do is find a way to construct sine of theta transmitted and cosine of theta transmitted. Instead of finding theta transmitted directly, we're gonna find sine of theta transmitted as a complex number and cosine of theta transmitted as a complex number. All right, that's it. Okay, so gamma is alpha two plus J beta two. All right. Uh, all right, so for lossy media, the Snell's law is the same as it is for lossless media, except we use gamma instead of uh, say N, if you honor square root of epsilon R or whatever, right? Okay, so we know what gamma one and gamma two are. Gamma one and medium one, this is epsilon one and mu one. So it's nothing but J beta one, right? In medium two, we have epsilon two, mu two, and sigma two. So we have alpha two plus J beta two. So this is our Snell's law. So we already found sine of theta transmitted. We need sine of theta transmitted, cosine theta transmitted. All right? Okay. So we use Snell's law to find sine of theta transmitted. We use the same law to find cosine of theta transmitted, except now what we do is we say, uh, you know, cosine of theta is equal to the square root of one minus sine squared of theta transmitted. And we know how to relate theta transmitted to theta incident, that's exactly what Snell's law does, right? So we, we then substitute in this expression for sine of theta transmitted and square it, and we end up with this, all right? So cosine theta transmitted, that's going to be some complex number. We write it in polar form. S e to the j zeta, yeah? Good, okay, good, good, good. So now we have sine of theta and cosine of theta transmitted. Now we just go back to our expression for E total and we substitute everything in, yeah? So here's sine of theta transmitted, here's cosine of theta transmitted. All right. Uh, we'll get to some anisotropic media, but not with loss. That's a complex problem. I mean, you can solve it, right? but you'd have to sit down and think about it. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right, so substitute in these expressions for sine and cosine. And then what do we have? we have? We have a FOIL to do here, right? We have to FOIL all of this out. And once we FOIL it all out, then we can collect all of the phased exponentials and the decaying exponentials, right? So these ones here, all that have e to the minus j something, <coughs> Those are phase terms. And the, everything that has e to the minus z times something without a j is a uh, exponential decay. So, okay, good. So if you collect all those terms, 
So you collect all the real exponentials and all the complex exponentials. Then what you find is this expression. You can call this entire thing here S times that. We call that P, all right? That becomes our effective uh, attenuation constant, right? Because that's everything. You can write this as E to the minus alpha Z, and we call this alpha 2E, right? Okay, everything else here, well, we're going to define Z to be this. So, or sorry, Q. So we define Q to be this. Why is that? Because these have similar forms, right? This P and this Q have very similar forms. They're S multiplied by alpha 2, beta 2, cosine, except they have a different sign and the sine and cosine are interchanged, right? So there must be some relation that we can make use of there. All right, so we now have this expression. Uh, which is repeated here. And what we do from here is we look at the phase terms, right? So let's look at this phase term here. What is beta one X sine theta plus ZQ, which is this beta one X sine theta plus ZQ. Well, that's this, right? We can write it like this. We can split this term. So we have beta X one X sine theta and QZ that's from here and here, and we multiply and divide by that. We'll see why we do that, all right? Uh, no, I think it's we're just multiplying by this factor and dividing by it. So that, we'll see why, because there's a triangle, a nice triangle hidden in there. Okay, so here we are. So here's our expression that we derived by defining what sine and cosine are in terms of complex Snell's law. And here's our expression we're looking at for the phase. If we define an angle psi two, which is this angle, the transmission angle, we need to find that angle because it's not as easy as, as uh, using the Snell's law to find it now. We have, we have to consider it a little more deeply. So first thing we can do is we can define beta one sine theta equal to u. So that makes this into ux and qz, all right? And they have the same denominator. Okay, so what that does is it allows us to write, um, so this expression here becomes u squared, or u divided by u squared plus q squared squared of all that. And the other expression here becomes q divided by u squared plus q squared squared of all that, right? These two have a triangle interpretation, a trigonometric interpretation. If this is the angle psi two, then uh, sine is opposite over hypotenuse. So this is u, this is q, which makes this u squared plus q squared, right? Now we can find the angle psi two easily by doing the inverse tangent of u divided by q. Very good, yeah? All right. We needed that psi two, that's the transmission angle. We need to know what the transmission angle is into this loss in media. Obviously the loss affects the transmission angle, right? Okay. So now we go back to our electric field and we know what uh, psi two is and we can rewrite this whole thing in this following form, right? Ux, u squared plus q squared, qz. We have a definition for u now, so we need to unpack this notation with a u. We have a definition for P and we have a definition for Q. So there are three functions hidden in here. There's U, Q, and P, right? We know what U is, it's there. And we define P and Q here on this slide, right? All right. But those are also functions of zeta, which is a function of, or functions of S and zeta, and then alpha two and beta two. So we'll do an example that, that collects all this together, all right? All right, so what are the conclusions? Oh, okay, one more thing. We can also write this in this form. We can say that it's beta two and n psi. Now we know the direction of psi, right? We know psi, is, we know the angle with respect to the normal to the interface. So we can write a unit vector in that direction, call it n hat psi. We also call that beta two e. We already found alpha two e, right? Alpha and medium two effective. Here we're finding beta in medium two effective as a vector, but uh, it has direction x hat sine of psi two plus z hat cosine of psi two. We found psi two, right? 
and beta to e square root of u squared plus q squared. So of course we can make a triangle here, right? And if we know this angle psi two, then we can find what uh, the unit vector is in this direction, right? We could find the unit vector in that direction. It's nothing but sine of psi two, cosine of psi two, z hat, x hat, right? Very, very good. And then the magnitude of beta two, this vector is here, square root of u squared plus q squared. So what are the consequences? The true angle of refraction is psi two and not theta transmitted. Theta transmitted is complex. If you go directly to Snell's all, you'll get a complex angle, then you're, you're confused, right? But what you can do is follow this procedure. We find sine of theta and cosine of theta transmitted as complex numbers, right? And then we form this, we form this expression here where we can start to envision a triangle, construct the triangle, and then the, the angle of that triangle gives it a true angle of refraction. The wave travels along a direction defined by the unit vector and psi. Now, the constant phase planes, so take a look here. The constant phase planes are perpendicular to the unit vector and psi because the transmission angle is in this direction, right? This is beta two effective, and the constant phase planes are orthogonal to that, right? Great, because the constant phase planes are always orthogonal to the direction propagation K, right? Okay, but what about the constant amplitude surfaces here? E to the minus ZP. So that only has dependence on the coordinate variable Z. So it decays normal to the interface. Here are the constant amplitude planes, normal to the interface, right? So it decays in a different direction than the phase delays because the phase delay depends on X and Z, whereas the decay only depends on Z. Interesting. So here's where we had that example. And what I'm going to do is move into the book. So this comes from your book, it's example 5-8. And this is a plane wave of either perpendicular or parallel polarization traveling in air obliquely incident upon a planar interface of copper with the conductivity given there. All right, so we have a plane wave, both polarizations, perpendicular and parallel. It's traveling from air and it's obliquely incident upon a planar interface of copper. So imagine this desk right here is copper and we're coming in obliquely on it, right? With either polarization. So we wanna calculate what's transmitted in. At the frequency of 10 gigahertz, determine the angle of refraction and the reflection coefficients for each of the two polarizations. All right, so first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna check what are, we need to calculate alpha and beta, right? So let's go back. First thing we need to do is calculate, oh shoot. Here, we need alpha two, beta two, right? Alpha, our sine of theta and cosine of theta is a function of alpha two, beta two, but then we can get S and E to the J theta, or sorry, S and zeta, once we know alpha two and beta two, right? So first thing, we need to find alpha two and beta two. But we have a table from a lecture, previous lecture, that has many different forms of alpha two and beta two, right? So we can check which one of those forms we need. The general form, as we saw, the general form is here. The general form is there, right? You can always use this form, but their calculations are more involved and you might not need to do that because things, um, if it's a good conductor or a good dielectric, then the formulas are different, right? There are approximate forms that are reduced, we used the binomial expansion to derive them, right? And kept only the leading terms. So here we have to calculate what's the ratio of sigma over omega epsilon. And what we do, what we get when we calculate that is a very large number, 10 to the eight, greater than one, right? Good, so according to the table that has all of our different attenuation and propagation constants for lossy media, alpha two and beta two, oops, alpha two and beta two are given by the square root of omega mu sigma over two, right? Good. So we calculate alpha two and beta two. Now we can calculate sine of theta transmitted using Snell's law. What do we get when we plug all this in? Alpha two plus J beta two, they're the same, right? Except we know beta has a J. So if alpha is the same as beta, we could factor that out and just call it some coefficient, which is this, multiply by one plus J, yeah? All right, then 
uh, we calculate this number. If we do calculate this number for sigma two much greater than one, sigma two is 10 to the seventh. So if sigma two is much greater than one, then this term goes to zero. So it's approximately equal to zero. That means that sine of theta transmitted is zero, which means the transmission angle is practically zero. It's approximately zero, right? Which means no matter what angle that we come in at, because of the high conductivity, we always transmit in normally on conductive, on conductive media. So remember that if it's a highly conductive metal, we come in obliquely, then we transmit into it normally. We go normally into it. Yeah, we go directly normally into it. So as a matter of fact, that was one of my questions on my preliminary, they call it preliminary where I did my doctorate. Uh, we hear they call it qualifying exam, but one of those questions for me was oblique incidence on the conductor and then talked about skin effect, but there was that transmission angle becomes normal incident. That was the key. But anyway, that's it. So, all right, now let's calculate the cosine of data transmitted, right? Well, we know what data transmitted is. What is it? Zero. So cosine of data transmitted is one. Then that means that S e to the J zeta is going to have S equal to one and zeta equal to zero in order for that equation to hold. So we found a lot of the key components we need now. All right, now that we have, we have S, we have zeta, we can now calculate P and Q because P and Q are nothing but a function of S, zeta, alpha, two, and beta two. So we calculate all of those quantities and we find that P and Q are the square root of omega mu two sigma two over two, which is the same as alpha two and beta two, right? Good. All right, now we need to find our transmission angle. We have P and Q, we need to calculate U. Remember, it's transmission angle we found to be the inverse tangent of U over Q, right? U was beta one sine theta I. All right, Q is beta two because P and Q are equal to beta or alpha, right? All right, so if you do the inverse tangent of this, and you express beta one as omega squared of mu naught epsilon naught because it's free space. We have sine of theta i, beta two is the square root of omega mu naught sigma two over two. Then we can carry out this calculation here by uh, combining these exponentials and canceling the mu's and the omegas and so forth, or one of the omegas, or half of the square root of the omega. Then uh, we find this expression. But we can we know that this is less than or equal to this expression is less than or equal to the expression with, when theta i is equal to well, 90, right? When you maximize the sine of theta. All right, so we know for sure that psi 2 is less than this quantity here, which we can't calculate because we weren't given the incident angle. All right, if you calculate this quantity, you get inverse tangent of this number here. Okay, so psi 2 then is, which is equal to the inverse tangent of this multiplied by sine of theta right? We, we kind of omitted that, which is guaranteed less than this number here is equal to, okay, so it's this many degrees, 7.96 times 10 to the minus three degrees. So psi two is less than that. All right, so we found the transmission angle. The reflection coefficients for perpendicular and parallel polarization reduced to, all right, so, okay, so we have so theta transmitted, we know, right? So we can say cosine of theta transmitted is one. So we know theta transmitted, we can reduce these expressions to these. Once you know that, then you can uh, cancel the eta twos because now uh, over here, we, we can express, we divide through by eta two rather, sorry. We divide through by eta two. All right. And then we can calculate gamma one like that. We can calculate the ratio of eta one to eta two by using the expressions for these wave impedances, the complex wave impedance and medium two regular wave impedance in medium one. If you do this calculation, you get this quantity here, yeah? Sigma two squared to sigma two over J omega epsilon naught. And uh, okay, so we know we know what sigma two is and we can, we can calculate that number, right? We know sigma two, we know omega and epsilon naught. We find that that number is much greater than one, which is greater than cosine theta incident. All right because it's one times 10 to the fourth. So one, which is greater than cosine theta incident. All right. So if you go plug that back in, what you'll find is 
It's greater than cosine theta incident. That means that a to two, a to one over a to two, if we subtract some number that's much greater from a smaller number, then this can be approximately minus one, right? We have some huge number here. We take some number less than one, we subtract a huge number. And then we divide by that same huge number. It's practically minus one. Same with this one, minus one. So for a very good conductor such as copper, the angle of refraction approaches zero and the magnitude of the reflection coefficients for perpendicular and parallel polarizations approach unity. And they're essentially independent of the angle of incidence. Conclusion. Good, okay, any questions? All right, good. That's kind of a more complex topic. So that's good that you guys following that well. All right, so we did this last time too, derivation of the input impedance, but we need it for this. Okay, so we're gonna look at multiple interfaces. All right, so the reflection coefficient at the boundary of a single planar interface under normal incidence was found to be this, right? We found the boundary, the reflection coefficient at the boundary, a to two minus a to one over a to two plus a to one, normal incidence, yeah? That's defined by E reflected or re-incident. The reflection coefficient, we can also reference it at a different plane, right? Because here we derive the reflection coefficient at the boundary. That's what the superscript B means now. But what is the reflection coefficient at some other point? What is the definition of reflection coefficients? E reflected over E incident. I can take that ratio anywhere I want. I can take it here at the boundary, or let's say E reflected e or E incident or E reflected divided by E incident, E reflected divided by E incident at this plane, right? I can ratio those fields anywhere I want. All right, so let's say we want to ratio it here, for example, which is at Z equals two minus L, right? This is the plus Z axis, so this is minus L, all right? Okay, so gamma Z equal to minus L at Z equal to minus L, is E reflected at Z, E incident divided, in general, it's E reflected over E incident at some coordinate variable Z, but we're gonna substitute it in Z equal to minus L. And if you do that, you get, we know what E reflected is, it's gamma at the boundary times E naught E to the plus J beta one Z divided by E naught E to the minus J beta one Z. But now we're gonna plug in Z equal to minus L, right? And if you do that, you get, Gamma at the boundary multiplied by e to the minus 2j beta 1l. All right, good. That we're going to say is gamma, the input, the input gamma at z equal to minus l. Fine. Just to the right of the boundary in medium 2. So in here, the input impedance is in the z direction, or in the z direction is equal to the intrinsic impedance of medium 2, right? If I look here and I look into this medium, it's infinite and unbounded. What is my total electric field here in this medium? On this side, just on this side, right? What is the, what is the electric field on that side? Very good, E transmitted, right? Or T times E incident, very good. That's the only thing we expect because there's no other discontinuity. That's not true if there was some other discontinuity because something would be coming back and adding to my transmitted electric field, right? So because we know that there's no discontinuity way down anywhere infinitely away, then we can be sure that the electric field here is E transmitted. The magnetic field is H transmitted. <clears throat> so the wave impedance here for sure is E transmitted over H transmitted. And in this medium, that becomes the square root of mu two over epsilon two. So we can be guaranteed that the wave impedance looking that way, no matter where I go in that medium, is always a to two because there's no, nothing coming back, no reflections, right? Okay, good. So we can say that the input impedance at z equal to zero plus just on the other side of the interface, the plus side of the interface is a to two, all right? Square root of mu two or epsilon two. Thus, okay, now we can say the input impedance at a distance of z equal to minus L. Now, what is the input impedance seen looking here, right? At this point, let me draw it. So I wanna know what, what is the input impedance seen from here looking to the right at that point? All right, well, we just need to ratio the total fields, right? That's equal to minus L. 
E total is equal to minus O over H total is equal to minus O. Well, on this side, we have to worry about an incident and a reflected field from the discontinuity. So E incident plus E reflected over H incident minus H reflected, right? Because magnetic field switches direction. Remember that. All right. So E incident is E not E to the plus J beta 1 L multiplied by 1. E reflected is the same incident field multiplied by gamma at the boundary displaced or translated or referenced to a new plane at minus L, which we found to be multiplied by E to the minus 2J beta 1 L. Yeah? That's the electric field gamma at this point multiplied by E incident at that point, right? Okay, same thing with the magnetic field. Remember the minus sign. Then uh, what we can do there is we recognize this quantity here. We called it gamma in, fine. And then we say A to 1 here. So E naught, we can divide all this out. These two cancel. E naught over E naught cancels. We end up with A to 1, 1 plus gamma in over 1 minus gamma in. This formula is probably familiar, but in S parameters, right? Z naught, 1 plus S11 divided by 1 minus S11. And then here, if you substitute in what gamma in is, you get this formula, which you've undoubtedly used in your, in your studies, which is the formula for transmission line theory input impedance. But now we derived it from a plane wave perspective reflection off of an interface. So that's the, that's the beauty of this transmission line theory. When you first learned it, you probably didn't know its novelty or its usefulness. But now all of these waves impinging upon interfaces, reflection transmission, and, and all of that have a transmission line analogy which are super easy to solve. Transmission lines are way easier to solve. There's no vector nature to it. You just have scalar waves and you have just some formulas that you need to remember. Yeah, we'll do that. All that stuff applies though. Quarter wave trans transformers and all of the things you learned with matching networks and transmission line theory, you can build for, wa for waves and interfaces. Okay, let's do it now then. So we have multiple interfaces now. This is a tough problem if you want to do it in field theory, right? If you want to carry the vector nature and follow all the electric and magnetic fields and everything, now you can do this using a transmission line analogy, which is very quick. So let's start with region three at Z equals to zero. Here is the, okay, so let's, let's set up the problem. We have three media, medium one, medium two, and medium three, right? They have epsilon one, mu one, eta one, epsilon two, mu two, eta two, epsilon three, mu three, eta three. Okay, the axes are here. Z goes that way, and we have some x-axis, for example. All right? So Z equal to zero is here. All right, we have some wave incidence on this medium. It's going to reflect and it's going to transmit, right? When it transmits, it's going to encounter another interface where it reflects and transmits. And we want to find what the transmitted field is. We want to find the fields everywhere. All right? Matter of fact, I gave you this problem in your qualifying exam. So this, this uh, has a very, very simple solution now, right? Okay, start with region three at z equals to zero. In region three, the input impedance is Z in equal, at Z equal to zero plus is A to three. Like we said, there's nothing, no other interfaces on this side. So there's no reflected field. So we can be guaranteed that E transmitted and H transmitted are the only fields here. If you divide the two, you should get the wave impedance of the intrinsic impedance of this medium, which is also the wave impedance. And therefore we can say that Z in at, at the positive side of the zero interface gives you A to three. The input reflection coefficient at the same interface. Okay, so this is how you convert from a, a uh, reflection coefficient and a wave impedance, which is a common technique, right? So uh, I think we derived that formula here. Let's go back. Gamma in terms of Z. So here's Z in terms of gamma. You have to invert this expression, all right? And get gamma in terms of Z. So that's what this is. So once we have Z in at zero plus, we can say gamma in at zero plus, zero minus is equal to Z in at zero plus minus A to two over Z in at zero plus plus A to two. 
All right, question. At this interface, we found the input impedance based on which components of the fields, normal or transverse? So we found this input impedance here, Z in equal to A to three in this medium. Did we use the transverse or the normal components to find that wave impedance? Transverse, right? It's the ratio of transverse electric and magnetic fields to the direction of propagation. So E, say E X, or divided by H Y gives you the uh, wave impedance in this medium, right? Ratio transverse components to the direction of propagation. Okay, good. So what else do we know about this? This is an interface between two dielectric media. What do we know about those transverse components? What boundary condition? They're what? They're continuous. So the wave impedance is continuous across the interface, right? The wave impedance is constructed from tangential field components on this side of the interface. Those tangential field components are continuous across the interface. Therefore, the wave impedance is the same on both sides at the interface, right? The wave impedance is continuous because it's made from tangential field components. All right. So gamma in at zero minus, you can get that from Z in at zero plus because Z in at zero minus is Z in at zero plus. All right, so you get A to three minus A to two over A to three plus A to two at Z equal to minus D plus. Now, so now we're talking about here, Z equal to minus D plus. We use our other formula, which is the translation of, we look at the input impedance, right? This formula here. So now we know what the load is, or we can write it in terms of gamma. We don't even have to consider the load, right? A to two, one plus gamma over one minus gamma. We know what gamma is at Z equal to zero minus at this point. So we can calculate, and we know what the distance D is. We can calculate exactly what the input impedance is looking uh, here, right? Z in at Z equals to minus D plus, yeah? Using that formula. Okay, so you get this result. Then the input reflection coefficient at Z equal to D minus. So the input reflection coefficient at Z here equals to uh, negative D minus right here, gamma N. That is nothing but the same formula again. Gamma N is Z N minus D plus minus A to one over Z N at minus D plus plus A to one. And we get this expression here. All right, good. So this is the reflection coefficient at the interface of this multi-layer structure. So we can then tune D, what should be the thickness of D in order to make gamma go to zero. You can use this formula. Then you can make an anti-reflection coating. You can make a matching layer. So I have some, some wave impinging upon a lens that I designed from a feed and I have some radiation from the feed. It's impinging upon the lens. I want to add a small thin dielectric layer to the input interface of the lens so that I get everything going into the lens and transmitting out instead of having it reflect back to the feed, right? So I can design one of these kinds of layers. Okay, so it's narrow banded in that case. You'll kill the bandwidth of the lens with this approach. But anyhow. Uh, how far away is from the source? Well, we're plane waves here, right? These are all plane waves. But if you have some kind of spherical wave and you have a big enough lens, you can assume, you know, with, with pretty good approximation that you have local plane waves. Remember we did stationary phase approximation. If you're in the far field of a source, then every, the only thing that comes to you at your observation angle is one plane wave. So local plane waves in the far field. So you can still model, you can still use all these equations and expressions. Uh, you know, if I have a spherical wave, let me draw it. If I have a small source here, I have a spherical wave, I get to the far field along this little point, this looks like a local plane wave. And then when I calculate this point, this looks like a plane wave, local plane waves. So I can calculate as if this was a plane wave, then I move to the next point and I can just model all these as, as an array of local plane waves. All right, so what do we notice here? We have some intrinsic reflection coefficients, which are A to two minus A to one, this one, this one and this one, 
I can use these definitions and rewrite it like this. Okay, good. All right, that's a cool problem. That's a tough problem. So that's good that that uh, we have we now can solve those, right? All right, cool. So I've threw in some extra bonus topics here for us. We have uh, we have to get through this lecture today to stay on schedule. So let's do that. So double negative materials. What are those? They briefly talk about this in your book, so I included it. Plus, I work on metamaterials, so I thought you'd uh, enjoy it. So we have this, this plot here. We have epsilon and mu. Epsilon is the horizontal axis. Mu is the vertical axis. Epsilon and mu can have different signs, right? In metamaterials, one of the very first things that were hypothesized were the existence of, uh, or what if a medium had negative index of refraction, then what would happen, right? Well, in order to do that, you need both epsilon and mu to be negative. And there are ways to do that. So epsilon and mu can be positive or negative. There are different combinations. If you're in this first quadrant, then epsilon and mu are positive, right? If you're in this quadrant, then epsilon is negative, but mu is positive. And if you're in this quadrant, then they're both negative. And if you're in this quadrant, then epsilon is positive, but mu is negative, all right? And these regions have, these types of materials have different names. The, this one is double positive. You've already studied all of this. Isotropic dielectrics, right-handed plane wave, or right-handed propagation, positive wave propagation, phase delays in the direction of, you know, power. You do look at anisotropic media, so power and, and um, phase delay can be in different directions, but nothing, nothing fancy here, right? All right, here we have epsilon negative materials. You can get those plasmas. They have negative permittivity. Uh, metals at optical frequencies. We looked at Drude dispersion in lecture two. And in that, in that uh, lecture, we saw that we can get negative epsilon if we operate below the plasma frequency, right? Okay. Or you can get, or evanescent. Okay, these waves are evanescent. These are evanescent decaying waves. They're not propagating waves. And we'll see why. Because if you think about the K vector there, then the K vector is a square root omega. So remember this, K is omega square root mu epsilon. So if only one of these are negative, like mu or epsilon, then this thing, that square root's gonna have a J come out of it. It'll be a negative. And then this becomes evanescent, all right? Over here, we have mu negative materials, ferrite, magnetic materials. I don't know if we looked at split rings or not, but split rings have this property. They have a magnetic uh, that can be negative. They have a resonance and you can operate below the resonance or, or around the resonance to get a negative permeability, permeability. Here we have double negative material. So these are not found in nature. This is where you have negative index of refraction, but funny things happen over here. You have left-handed, left-handed uh, E cross H gave you the direction of propagation before and the direction of travel, but now you have to use your left hand to do that. So it's called left-handed media sometimes. The phase advances in the direction of, in the direction of uh, travel. So instead of phase delaying, phase is advancing. It's a funny looking thing. You have to look at some finite difference time domain animations to appreciate it. All right, so the index of refraction is defined as n squared equal to epsilon mu. All right, so n is the square root. There's a plus and a minus. We have to be cognizant of which one of these signs we choose. Okay, so... Uh, we have negative magnitude of epsilon and negative magnitude of mu, right? Or absolute value. And both of these are negative, so those negatives cancel. All right, well, we can write this as J into the square root. So we can separate this, right? So we could have the square root of minus epsilon R multiplied by minus mu R like that. And uh, these, these you can write as J into this and J into that. Now you have, you have J squared, which is minus one. So it inverts the order of this and you have the square root of mu epsilon, all right? All right, so some mathematics there. The negative sign is chosen resulting in double negative materials. So we choose the negative sign for, for those two materials, these negatives, all right. Snell's law at the interface between a double positive and a double negative medium. We have this as Snell's law, but now uh, theta transmitted is like this, right? 
but one of these is negative. Okay, so what does that lead to? That leads to negative refraction. I don't think I have a picture of it yet. Uh, but here you come in like this and you refract away from the normal, right? If you come in like this, you refract in that direction. Normally you refract this direction. This is theta transmitted for a double positive, but double negative media, your transmission angle is this way. All right. All right, the wave number in the double negative medium is here. Thus, the phase advances with distance rather than delaying. So here's the E cross H, one half E cross H conjugate gives you the uh, pow power flow in, the, in a double positive medium. But in a double negative medium, S and beta, S and beta are in the same direction. Beta and S are in the same direction and double positive. See, this is all these cool things you can do. You can have negative material parameters, you can have anisotropy and you can start to play with beta versus S, right? Anisotropic media, you uh, beta and S are not in the same direction anymore. And you can have double negative media now or negative index media where beta is this way, but S is that way. So that's why it's called left-handed medium. So here's E, here's H. E crossed with H gives you both beta and S in this medium, right? But in the left-handed medium where double negative, you have to use your left hand. E cross with H gives you beta. E cross with H, one half real part, it has to give you power flow always. All right, but one, but E cross with H gives you the direction of phase delay or propagation. That now is left-handed in double negative media, called left-handed media. All right. Okay, so here's some negative refraction. What time, we go till uh, 45 after, right? Yeah. All right, so here's negative refraction. We have some pulse coming in, represented by wave fronts, and it, it encounters a medium and it refracts negatively. Yeah? Look what else is happening. The phase, the wave fronts look like they're traveling this way. That's phase delay, right? But this medium, the wave fronts are traveling in the opposite direction, but power is going that way. The pulse is going that way, but the wave fronts are going toward the interface. That's this anti-parallel S and K, right? So it's very interesting, yeah? Yeah, I mean, you could watch this all day. Okay, so let's look. Snell's law of refraction can be expressed as, of course, data transmitted like this, contains negative index, the transmission angle will be negative. All right. Very good. So let's do a little bit more rigorous calculation of that. The wave vectors of the incident reflected and transmitted fields can be expressed in the following way. Beta, this wave vector of the incident wave has a magnitude beta one, and we can in general write it as X sine theta incident plus Z cosine theta incident. And we can say beta one is N omega over V, right? Because, uh, okay, so beta is the square root of mu. You can relate these, right? And then we have this part the same. Beta reflected, we do the same exact thing, but now we're, we're saying that it's a negative. So let's go to this picture here. All right, so what do we have? Here, yeah, we should have described this first. Here's beta incident and S incident. We're in a double positive medium on this side, double negative medium on this side. We have an incident or reflected in a transmitted field, all right? We're coming in at an angle theta I here, and because this is a double positive medium, we obey by the Snell's regular law of reflection in this medium. So theta I is equal to theta R. Now, you'll notice theta T here, in this double negative medium, beta is anti-directed to S, right? And we see that in the animation. All right. Now, uh, beta incident is this vector. We found it here. It has an X and a Z component because this is the X axis, this is the Z axis. All right. Beta reflected now, the Z, the Z component is, is, is uh, negated because it's traveling this way. Along the Z axis, it's traveling that way, right? The incident field was traveling this way, but along the Z axis, it's going that way. All right. So beta transmitted now. Uh, okay, so beta transmitted. We have beta 2, X sine of data transmitted minus Z cosine data transmitted in general because we see that beta here has... Okay, you have to remember beta here has a negative Z and a positive X. 
So here's the positive X and then here's the negative Z, right? Because of this negative refraction. So we gotta be cognizant of that, all right? We need to find what data transmitted is, but we'll take the absolute value. All right, the pointing vectors can be expressed as one half magnitude E naught squared over eta multiplied by the uh, S vector, unit vector, right? As reflected, it just has gamma. As transmitted, it has the transmission coefficient. And then we have this expression here because S is negative X plus Z, where beta is plus X minus Z, right? They're anti-parallel. All right, so the wave vector is anti-parallel pointing vector in the double negative medium. So it's just some accounting for refraction. We have interfaces. That's what we're studying in this lecture. Interfaces, discontinuities between infinite half spaces. We looked at, uh, you know, Conductive media, we looked at uh, dielectric media, oblique incidents, normal incidents, reflection and transmission coefficients in all these cases, lossy media, and now, and then we looked at multiple interfaces at normal incidents at least. Now we're looking at media interfaces between uh, ne double negative media, double positive media, or, or metamaterial and free space or something. Yes? At the boundary in the picture, is like, Kind of dotted line is that kind of the wave or is this dotted line? Um, in the animation, like the at the boundary. Oh yeah, that's just the animation. So uh, the it's like the interference between the. Yeah, it's just the bright spots of the two wave fronts. It's funny because one wave front is going this way, and the other one looks like it's coming to meet it, but it's not. Right? It's just this wave is refracting and going that way. The pulse goes through the interface, but the wave fronts are phase advancing in the double negative medium. So it goes against your, your uh, regular intuition, right? This side looks totally like a wave that we'd expect. There's wave, planar wave fronts, like if you're at the beach, these planar wave fronts are like surfers riding these waves and they're going to the shore, right? That's what we expect. This is phase of delay. But over here, the way, I don't even know how to explain it. So the, the waves are, still coming to the beach, but the surfers are going out to the ocean. I don't know. So something where uh, the phase is, is the wave fronts are going the opposite direction as the wave is traveling. So what happens if you're two double negative media to reflection? The reflection of going towards? Wait, you're saying if we have an interface between two double negative media? Uh, what happens to the reflection? That's a good question. I think you would just have to have, uh, you would have beta, you just have to consider your incident field having beta and S anti-parallel and whatever direction it's incident at in that medium, it's gonna refract negatively still, Intu intuitively, I believe. <laughs> if they had differing, I haven't solved that problem. That's a good problem. It'll still refract. Uh, oh, that's a good question. Maybe it won't. I have, you'd have to work out the, it's all in the expressions, right? It's all in the Snell's law. So you can you can look in there. Okay. All right. How many slides do we have left? I need to finish this by today. Let me check. We have some exciting things to get to. Okay, yeah, we got it. Okay, so perfect lens. So now, what if we have two interfaces here? So we have, let me see, why isn't this playing? Oh, man. It says it cannot play the media. Okay, that's kind of a bummer. Anyway, you can look at this in your book. So what happens here is with a perfect lens, you can have uh, focusing at some point within this double negative. So you have a double negative slab here. And you have free space on both sides. And uh, this, this discussion would be a lot better if you could see what's going on here. But imagine you have two interfaces, right? So you have double positive, what we had in the last slide, so we have negative refraction. So we have negative refraction and the wave that's going this way. So this is a point source that's emanating. It hits the interface here, negative refract, negative refracts. Hits the interface here, negative refracts. Since they're both negative refraction, it focuses again inside of the double negative medium. It goes through that focus and now it's regular refraction because we're now going back into a positive media and it focuses again outside of the lens. So you get a perfect reconstruction of the source at this side. And it turns out it also includes all of the amplitude and evanescence spectra as long as you couple them all in to this lens, right? So it's a perfect lens. It beats the diffraction limit.
you get all the evanescent information reconstructed on the output. Um, notice that this is all matched though, there's no reflection. So N is equal to one here, minus one here, and one here. All right, you can read about that. Okay, let's look at double refraction now or birefringence. So anisotropic media, we studied that earlier, last lecture, now we're gonna use it. We studied anisotropic media, wave propagation in un infinite unbounded media. What happens when we have waves incident at an interface between an anisotropic media and an isotropic medium? Yeah? So, uh, so what do we have here? We have some wave which is incident upon some kind of anisotropic uh, medium or crystal. The optic axis is defined here to be in that direction. And we have some wave which has two polarizations in it, right? Some polarized light, or it has multiple polarizations, both polarizations. It's going to refract into this medium, this anisotropic medium, and the two refracted polarizations are going to see a different index of refraction, right? Because of the anisotropy. So the two polarizations see a different medium. And therefore, they're refracted different angles, and they'll, they'll also occur different phase delay going through the medium, right? And then when they refract out, they, the two polarizations will be separated, which is nice. You might be able to design like a polarization separator if you can separate them far enough. And they'll have different phase relationship. So in this example, optic axis along the surface is shown perpendicular to the plane of incidence. All right, so here's the plane of incidence with the normal vector and the the K vector, so this optic axis is perpendicular to the plane of incidence. Incoming light in the S polarization, which means perpendicular to the plane of incidence. And so in this example, it becomes parallel polarization to the optic axis. It's called the extraordinary ray. And it sees a greater refractive index than the light in the P polarization, which becomes an ordinary ray because perpendicular to the optic axis uh, is the perpendicular polarization. So S polarization undergoing greater refraction entering and exiting the crystal. So here's an actual crystal of this anisotropic media, birefringent. Uh, I forgot what they call this stuff, the Iceland spar or something like that. All right. Anyway, light is coming from here. It's going into this, and we're looking at the graph paper through it. What do we notice when we don't have the anisotropic crystal or isotropic medium? We see the regular graph lines. When we see it through the anisotropic crystal or medium, we see two images, a double image that are separated because of the different refraction angles of the light going into it, right? Let's look at this. Oh, it's called calcite too. So here, this is a polarizing filter. The dot determines the direction of polarization. We're rotating it. So only light that's you know orthogonal to this dot or whatever gets through, all right? So at some point, we see only calcite once, and then we see calcite twice when the polarization uh, allows both polarizations in. So Vertical, one polarization. Horizontal, one polarization. Diagonal, you see, you get both the polarizations in for a polarizing filter. If it's polarized diagonally, I get the vertical and the horizontal through it. When both polarizations go through, I see a double image. All right, let's do a quick, okay. So we now consider the case of plane wave incident in air upon an anisotropic half space or a crystal. All right, so here, here's the problem. Air crystal. Here's the optic axis. Remember, the index of refraction along the optic axis is ordinary and not. It's the ordinary, right? That's what the optic axis is. It's the in intersection between the two surfaces or the two sheets of the dispersion relation that give you the... Uh... Okay, so one thing. Those dispersion surfaces we were talking about before... Uh, Okay, maybe I can go back to it later if we have time, but remember when we had 1D dispersion? When we had 1D dispersion, we had omega over K, and we had some line like this. We said any point here, that gives you the ratio of omega over K. That was the phase velocity, right? Any point on the dispersion curve. And then we said the slope of the dispersion curve gives us the group velocity, right? When we looked at that dispersion equation that we derived from that determinant of that matrix equation, we ended up with a dispersion surface omega as a function of K1, K2, and K3. So now not just K1, but we have K1, K2, K3, and we end up with some surface that was omega. Now, 
the a point on the surface, if you go back to that lecture, re-listen to it, a point on that surface gave you the fa the k, the phase velocity, if you divide that point divided by k, right? Same as this, a point on the line gives you the phase velocity. And we said the gradient, the gradient in k space of this surface gave us the group velocity. So it's all the same thing, it's just in 3D now, all right? Okay, anyway. All right, so optic axis. All right, so we have two waves, ordinary and extraordinary. They have different refraction angles, and <clears throat> we're coming at an angle theta one or theta A. The normal is theta one and theta A with respect to the optic axis. All right, because the anisotropic medium supports two waves with distinctly different phase velocities and therefore different indices of refraction, an incident wave give rise to two refracted waves with different directions and different polarizations. We still have to abide by phase matching at the interface. That's the key to solving the problem. So K naught sine theta one is equal to K sine theta. So K naught, the K of this medium times sine of this angle theta one, which should give you the tangential vector here, has to equal, tangential K is continuous is what this means. K sine theta. So some K times the sine of theta transmitted. We know in an anisotropic medium, uh, uniaxial, the wave number K is given by N of theta K naught. Depends on your transmission angle. Remember, we had the ellipse, and depending on our angle that we traveled with respect to the optic axis, we picked up a different index of refraction. There was the polarization, or the ellipse. Okay, hence, sine of theta one. Okay, so let's drop the Ks, or not drop the Ks, right? Uh, yeah, because this K is now N of theta multiplied by K naught, so we can cancel the Ks. Sine of theta one is N of theta multiplied by sine of theta. Well, here we're going to say that we have some angle to the optic axis plus the angle of, of uh, transmission, whatever that may be. All right. So theta A is the angle between the optic axis and the normal to the surface. Therefore, theta A plus theta is the angle the refracted ray makes with the optic axis, which is what is required for the index in that direction for uniaxial media. To solve the modified Snell law equation, we draw the intersection of the K surface with plane of incidence and search for angle theta, which makes this equation satisfied. We have to have Snell's law, right? So here we have the K surface for air is this one. We have the K surfaces in the anisotropic medium. Remember, they always degenerate into a circle and an ellipse. Why? It's always a circle and an ellipse because, or a sphere, an ellipsoid, right? One of them is an ordinary refraction, which means it doesn't see any anisotropy. The other one is extraordinary, and it does see anisotropy. So anisotropy comes from an ellipse, Isotropy is from a, a sphere. Okay, so we get a sphere and an ellipsoid or a circle and an ellipse, and it's uniaxial media. So along the optic axis, the circle and the ellipse have the same radius. They intersect only at these two points. The circle is tangent to the ellipse. If this was biaxial media, then this circle would be a little bit bigger than this ellipse, and you'd have four intersection points. Okay, so here we have... K naught times sine of theta incident gives you this vector here. K naught sine theta incident, right? K naught sine theta incident is this part of this K vector, right? By phase matching or Snell's law, or Snell's law, which is derived from phase matching, the reflected, the refracted rays have to have the same exact K, right? So this refracted ray, you'll see, has to have the same projection onto the interface. The Snell's or phase matching, it has to hold. So this K naught sine theta I tells you what the X component or, or the interface component, parallel to the interface component of these refracted waves have to be. And now all you have to do is draw a line up to the dispersion surface that has that same tangential component of K, right? So here, this is the ordinary, the ordinary K. Therefore, this becomes the ordinary angle, theta naught. This is the extraordinary K. And therefore, 
this becomes the angle theta extraordinary. Yeah. Easy. Draw your case surfaces in the anisotropic media. Draw your case surface in the isotropic media at the interface, right? Have your K tangential has to match in both the trans incident and, and transmitted media. And we know we have two dispersion surfaces in the anisotropic media. We know they have to have the same tangential K. So the normal Ks are found by finding the intersection of the vector which goes from the origin to the K surfaces. Same as 1D dispersion. In 1D dispersion, in 1D dispersion, we said that the K vector or the phase velocity is given by the vector going from the origin to the dispersion curve. Here's our dispersion surface now, it's in 3D. Here's our other one. So the K vector is given by the vector which goes to the surface, yeah? What is the direction of power flow? It's proportional to the group velocity. The group velocity is the slope of the dispersion curve in 1D or the gradient of the dispersion surfaces in 3D. So it's normal to these. So this one is a circle. Obviously, K and S are in the same direction because the normal to that circle is also parallel to the radius. This medium has a normal like that. So the K vector in the anisotropic or the extraordinary ray is not parallel to the S vector. All right, good. Double refraction, okay. So K surface intersects the plane of incidence in a circle and an ellipse. The two refracted waves must satisfy the phase matching condition uh, and are determined by satisfying this expression. All right, so for which results in an ordinary wave of orthogonal polarization TE and angle theta naught. Okay, so we have that one, right? And the extraordinary, so theta ordinary and theta extraordinary TM polarized with this expression, which we find and theta from the polarization ellipse or the index ellipse uh, parameterization, parameterization of the ellipse. That's how you find n theta. All right, any questions? Okay, so, so much thrown at you, you probably don't have questions yet. You need to sit down and think about it and understand it in your own words. And then you'll have questions because you'll get stuck somewhere when you're trying to explain it to yourself, right? So do that. Make sure you go back over this in the last lecture on anisotropic media and, and try to understand it. That will make you a much more creative engineer, right, in the end, because you're going to have understanding of all this stuff. And when you go to solve a problem that would be very difficult in an ordinary way, but you use this anisotropic medium, then it becomes a creative and very efficient and quick solution or, or even a, a genius, or not genius, but, you know, a good way to do it. So uh, try to understand these things. Take the time because that will separate you from the person who didn't, and you'll come up with a better solution. You want to shine, right? All right, refraction. Okay, so because Nels are based on phase matching, they apply to wave fronts. All right, uh, the wave vector K is always normal to the wave fronts. Over an anisotropic media, the rays do not necessarily travel in directions normal to the wave fronts. The rays travel parallel to S, right? We know that. All right, uh, an example that dram dramatizes the derivation from Snell's law is that of normal incidence into a uniaxial crystal whose optic axis is neither parallel nor perpendicular to crystal boundary. So here is an optic axis, which is not parallel to the boundary or perpendicular to it. And uh, we're coming in normally incident with a single polarization here, or not single polarization. Uh, uh, normal incidence, okay, let's see. Here's the same figure, but looking above. The wave fronts are orthogonal to the K vector, right? All right. The incident K is normal to the interface. Since the, incident nor since the incidence is normal by phase matching, the refracted waves must also be in the same direction. Refracted K in the same direction, incident K. Okay, so there's no refraction when you come in normally incident, right? If you come in normal incident on even an anisotropic media, you get no refraction. So K vectors go in the same direction. You come in normally incident on some medium, you go normally into it, right? No refraction for a normal incidence, even an anisotropic. But the rays will undergo some kind of deflection because rays are the direction of power flow, the direction of S. All right, the ordinary ray is parallel to K. Ordinary ray, Nothing special about that. It's ordinary, just like isotropic medium. 
But the extraordinary ray will start to travel at some angle with respect to the uh, k vector, right? With respect to its k vector. So what you'll do is you'll end up separating this ordinary ray and extraordinary ray. You'll separate their power flow, right? Good. So when the two acts, two rays exit the medium, they separate into two laterally separated rays with orthogonal polarization. Yeah, so okay. The, this is a multi multipolarized incident wave. You need both polarizations in order for the medium to for the wave to sense the two different indices of refraction, and therefore the extraordinary ray propagates a different angle than the ordinary ray. Yeah. So yeah, it has both polarizations, of course, in order for the anisotropic medium to do anything. All right. Oh, good. We what happens if it's a circularly polarized wave? Well, you'll have both polarizations coming in. If you come in normally incident, then they both are, don't refract, right? Both polarizations. But some of the one polarization will get separated from the other, and you'll have a different phase delay. So it'll mess up the polarization. It's going to become maybe elliptical, and you'll mess up the axial ratio. So things will, things will, uh, that's an interesting thing. You can start to understand all this with this framework, right? Any other questions? All right, so we have nine lectures left, nine class periods left. We have, let me see if I can pull up this. Uh, hold on one second. All right. Uh, all right, so maybe we won't get, so the next lecture we're going to, the next chapter of the book, next lecture that we're going to study is my favorite in the whole book. I mean, not in the whole book, but one of my favorite, which is um, construction of solutions. How to calculate uh, electromagnetic waves that are radiated from sources. So far we've dealt with eigenmodes. We solved the independent wave equation. Um, the uh, the wave equation for source free wave equation, right? But now we're going to introduce sources. We have some current density in some point in space. We want to find what the uh, what the radiated fields are, right? So that's where things get fun. Let me see if I can pull it up. Okay, here we go. That's where things start to get fun. So this is the next lecture called lecture six, auxiliary vector potentials, construction of solutions and radiation, radiation, radiation. This is what we're all here for, radiation. We want to have some sources, they radiate, right? And we're able to calculate scattering, which we'll do scattering equations. We'll have those sources radiate the electromagnetic waves. Those waves will reflect or scatter off of different obstacles. We'll calculate the scattering in later in the course. And um, so that, that now we're getting into some fun things, right? So, uh, we, we have to solve these. We have to introduce the concepts of vector potentials, all right? So uh, we were introduced to these in lecture three when we had to solve the wave equation in spherical coordinates. Remember there, when we tried to uh, take the vector wave equation or the vector PDE and try to separate it into three scalar PDEs, we ended up with all three of those separated scalar PDEs coupled they each had ER, E theta, and E phi in them, right? So we couldn't solve them in that approach. Instead, what we had to do is we had to construct a new wave equation that was for the vector potential A or F that uh, utilized this concept of vector potentials. And then we were able to solve that, but we had to restrict ourselves to modes which were TE to R, right? Everything, whatever component we solved for, or TM to R, but whatever component we solved for, had to be an R-directed component. Whatever we use that apparatus to solve for the wave functions, they had to be an R-directed quantity. And then, of course, it could be vector potential. We can construct, you know, all the field components E theta, E phi from vector potential in the in the R direction. Okay. So, anyway, we're going to now formalize it more more um, rigorously and use it to the purpose of solving the inhomogeneous wave equation. Now we're going to keep the right hand side. We're going to be in source media, media that have sources. So this, this is the fun stuff. Okay. 
So that was just an introduction to that. I think we'll just end here. So watch the football game tonight, which will be, which will be a, a fun thing to do. I'll be going to it, as a matter of fact. All right. Any questions, uh, email me if you want. You got your homeworks. I don't know when the next homework will be coming soon, right? So I'll let you know. Uh, I'll email everybody if it's coming out before next class. And uh, all right. Thank you. Yeah, you'll get your midterms back very soon. I'll, I'll bring them next lecture. So uh, you'll have your midterm scores up next lecture. And then you'll have your homeworks return three, homework three, and we'll start grading homework four. Next lecture. All right. Great. See you on Halloween, right? Yeah, next lecture is Halloween. So oh, yeah. Oh, wow. I mean, I have started getting meals for the process, but it has the start date is from yesterday. Good. So you're GR right now. Great. And are you, so you're working as a master student, though? Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Good. I'm glad. Steve, Steve's a great person to work with. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to working on it. Yeah, very nice. Good. We were interested in radio astronomy stuff, right? So he's perfect. Very good. That's awesome. Glad to hear that. Let us know if you have a way to collaborate or interface. I know there is a project that Steve and I have a proposal out that should, we don't know if it's funded yet, but that project will bridge the two labs. So maybe you and my student will be working on it on either side of, of the project. Oh, that sounds fun. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you so much. All right. Have a good one. See ya.